I'm Elaine Imbruglia, president of Modica & Associates. Modica & Associates is a full-service ecological consulting firm. So Elaine, we're here to talk about sand skinks, and I know that not many people know what that is. So can you tell us what a skink is and why it's on the protected list? A sand skink is a small lizard that lives just beneath the surface of the soil in the central ridges of Florida. It typically occurs only in xeric communities or the uplands that are higher in elevation and in scrub communities. And it's protected probably because it only occurs in the central Florida um, area and nowhere else in the world. So the ridge, Florida has a ridge from Claremont to Lake Placid. The elevations are very high. Uh, does that play as a part in the uh, uh, habitat for a skink? Sand skinks only occur on the ridges of central Florida. And you need to worry about whether or not to test your land for the presence of sand skinks based on three criteria. And those criteria are location, elevation, and soils. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a survey protocol that outlines um, the consultation area for sand skinks, which in generally covers the central ridges of Florida. Uh, the elevation is 82 feet or higher, and there is a list in that protocol of suitable soils that are um, typical for the presence of sand skinks. So a lot of the properties traditionally through that stretch have been planted to citrus. So this is a, a, a species that would have potentially a lot of impact on, on citrus groves former and, uh, and current citrus groves. Is that correct? Sand skinks do occur in citrus groves, but the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does not regularly enforce um, any kind of activity against agricultural activities. So if you have an existing agricultural activity and your land is zoned for agricultural practices, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't regulate sand skinks in those properties. But if a, if a grove is in an area that uh, is experiencing growth from urban pressure, um, how, how would that impact a developer if uh, he wanted to uh, pursue the development of that property? A landowner or a citrus grove owner can manage his land or her land in such a way that might make the property less suitable for the presence of sand skinks. Sand skinks require open sandy soils to swim through the soils and if that habitat is not present they can't inhabit the area. So there are some citrus groves that have um, dense grasses between the rows and limited sandy soils. And if that's the case, your area of occupied habitat or where the sand skinks can occur are much smaller in, in area. What kind of expense is involved? Let's say you, you find a property, there are skinks on the property. What kind of, what implication for a developer does that have? If sand skinks are found on a piece of property, um, you have to delineate the occupied habitat or show where on the property the sand skinks occur. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service protocol states, or there's guidance from the service that states, for every observation of a sand skink, you draw an 80-foot buffer around that observation. And that is equivalent to about a half an acre. And for every acre of occupied habitat that you impact, you have to purchase two credits, which is the equivalent of two acres from a conservation bank to mitigate for that impact. And the current price for mitigation is about $25,000 per acre. Okay. So it could be a very expensive consideration. Yeah, so mitigation for one acre of occupied sand skink habitat could be about $50,000 more than the land value in some cases. In some cases. Um, what do you, I understand there's a lot of science out there available to have the skink delisted. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? There was a study done on a piece of property about six or eight years ago. It was originally thought that sand skinks only occurred in remnant scrub habitat, citrus groves, and not in other types of habitat. A study was done six to eight years ago, and they found that sand skinks, in fact, occur in planted pine, 
um, open fields and other areas as long as the open sand component is present. And in my opinion, sand skinks occur in many other areas that weren't originally thought where they occurred and I think that the sand skink probably should be delisted because they occur in, in other areas. So uh, explain to us the process for determining whether there are sand skinks on our property. So if you have a piece of property that meets the three criteria, the location, elevation, and soils, in order to test for sand skinks, you have to do a formal cover board survey. The only way to prove absence of sand skinks is to conduct a formal cover board survey. You can conduct pedestrian surveys, but that's only valid for documenting the presence of sand skinks. To conduct a formal cover board survey, you have to place two foot by two foot plywood cover boards across the piece of property at a density of 40 boards per acre. You throw the boards out on the property. They have to acclimate or they have to sit in place for seven days and then you check them once a week for four consecutive weeks. So Elaine, if a property owner has the three main criteria, elevation, location, and soil types, the assumption is skinks are there. How does a landowner prove skinks are not on their property. If a property meets all three criteria for sand skinks, location, elevation, and soils, the responsibility falls on the landowner to prove that sand skinks are or not, or not there. So you can do, you initiate the pedestrian survey or cover board survey. Pedestrian surveys can only prove presence of sand skinks. So if a landowner needs to prove absence, they need to initiate the formal cover board survey. What, what's involved in a cover board survey? A cover board survey entails throwing two foot by two foot plywood cover boards across a piece of property at a density of 40 cover boards per acre. There are some instances where the density of cover boards can be reduced if the habitat is less than optimal. So in other words, if you have a piece of property that has patchy areas of grass or a citrus grove with dense grasses in the, the rows and you can't get 40 cover boards per acre, there's too much ground cover, you can coordinate with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and request a reduction in cover board density. And how long do the cover boards have to stay out? The cover board survey lasts a total of five weeks. You place the cover boards on the property and the boards have to sit in place for about seven days and then you check the boards once a week for four consecutive weeks. And you document the GPS that the location of where you found those on the property? When we conduct a cover board survey, we lift each board individually and observe the sand beneath the cover board. And if we find any sand skink tracks, we mark that location with a handheld GPS. And then we come back and, and we also take a picture. Then we come back with all of our data and pictures and create a map using ArcGIS to delineate all of the areas that had um, a positive sand skink track and then we delineate the occupied habitat based on those observations. I understand you can't do a sand skink uh, cover board uh, inspection but a, a, a very limited time in the year. When does that occur? The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service sand skink survey protocol states that you can conduct pedestrian surveys year-round but pedestrian surveys are only valid if you find evidence of sand skinks. Cover board surveys can only be conducted between March 1 and May 15 of any, any given year. If a landowner or a land purchaser finds themselves outside of the March 1 to May 15 survey window, you can still conduct a site inspection to determine the, to determine the likelihood of the presence of sand skinks. If you're evaluating if the property has the three criteria, location, elevation, and soils, and you're outside of that window, if you go on site and you determine that conditions are not favorable or part of the property isn't favorable for sand skinks, you can at least um, have that determination to move forward in part um, and then initiate the formal survey if required when the survey window comes up the following year. A lot of the business that we have at Modica and Associates is for due diligence evaluations. When a person wants to purchase a piece of property, they need to understand if that property has listed species of wildlife, wetlands, any other ecological constraints that could 
preclude development or um, the cost implications of developing that property with those natural resources. So the first step that we do is a site inspection um, to determine the, the um, quality of the habitat and the types of habitat and what to determine what species may occur on that particular piece of property. And we review any publicly available databases to determine what species may occur in that area if there are consultation areas for protected species of wildlife. And we consider scrub jays, sand skinks, gopher tortoises, bald eagles, sandhill cranes, grasshopper sparrow, indigo snake, um, any of the federally and state protected species, we determine if that property falls within the consultation area. And then we provide recommendations to the landowner or to the person who is proposing to purchase the property and let them know if they need to do formal surveys for any protected species of wildlife. Um, we can tell them financial implications, mitigation costs for wetland impacts, and um, mitigation costs for impacts to protected species of wildlife habitat.